Good afternoon, and welcome back to the second part of Breaking Barriers, Centering Families, Transforming Systems. For those of you just joining us, I'm Tara Harper, Senior Director of Institutional Relations, Equity and Inclusion for Children's Home and Aid, and I'll be your host for the afternoon. This morning, best-selling author, comedian, and activist, Baratunde Thurston delivered a powerful keynote and engaged with our CEO, Mike Shaver, to help us understand this critical and historic moment we are all living through and examine how to rise to the challenge of advancing bold change together. We also shed light on the role of the corporate sector in helping to advance racial equity with our longstanding civic partner, BMO Harris Bank. We will build upon this morning's thought-provoking conversations in just a few minutes. But first, just a couple of quick reminders that will help you enjoy today's virtual program. You can still visit the booths to learn more about Children's Home and Aid and some of our key event partners. If you have questions for our speakers, they can be placed in the session chat and we'll do our best to answer them. Don't forget to join us on Twitter as we live, th live tweet throughout the day. Make sure to tag us and use hashtag breaking barriers. You can also connect with us on Facebook and Instagram. If you're having technical difficulties, send us a quick message through the chat function and we'll do our best to troubleshoot. If you'd like to get in touch with any one of our speakers or you miss the opportunity to connect with our staff during the lunch break, please visit the virtual booth to find contact information for all of today's speakers. And of course, if you're interested in learning more about how you can support our effort to break barriers, please text THRIVING to 61094. And now let's dive into this afternoon's agenda. To bring about long-term systemic change, we must ground everything we do in policy, using the community voice as our guide. Let's take a moment to learn about the role of our agency's Alqua Center for Policy, Practice, and Innovation, which is hosting this afternoon's conversation. The role of the Alquist Center for Policy, Practice, and Innovation is to lift up the direct work we do with youth and families and to support the innovation of programs both at Children's Home and Aid and really across the state and hopefully influencing nationally what best practice looks like to really work with not for, but with families and young people. Uh, leadership is knowing where you are where you are strong, where you have a unique viewpoint and where you can add something to the table. And leadership's also knowing that, you know, you're not the you're not the number one on this particular issue. Like let the folks who have a deep seated history um, in this space lead. And you know, you can be figure out where you are best to support that effort and do it that way biases have just worked their way into our work over time and we start responding in a certain way. And the Power of Fathers program is a really good example of how it was about direct services for dads. It was about looking at our own services. Like, you know, how are we welcoming to dads? And it was also about giving dads a voice saying, hey, this is what it looks like to go into my kid's school to be for the parent reading day and have the security guard ask why I'm there. I'm deeply gratified that our organization has recognized that we have to change our approach and that we have to focus on not just strengthening families, but strengthening the community around families, strengthening the laws and the policies and the systems around families that have more to do with a family not thriving than the individual situations of those families. And so taking that very broad but deep comprehensive approach to families is how we're going to begin to shift the tide, not only for us in the work that we do, but most importantly for the families and helping them get to the outcomes that they want for themselves. With the Alquist Center's work on social justice and equity, which is not new to Children's Home and Aid, coupled with our commitment to partner with families, right, to be coaches and guides and to listen, that's what will make the Blueprint for Impact real. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Paula Corrigan Halpern, Vice President of Public Policy and Strategic Initiatives at Children's Home and Aid. In the video we just watched, I mentioned Children's Home and Aid's Blueprint for Impact. The Blueprint for Impact is linked in the chat box. I encourage everyone to read it, and this afternoon, we are going to speak it. Our powerful moderator and panel are going to illuminate just what it will take to realize the commitments in our Blueprint for Impact. 
and they will push us to turn citizenship into a verb and step up and citizen as our morning speaker Baratunde Thurston challenged us to do. We will delve into strategies for advancing robust policies and social supports that are anti-racist, equitable, and aimed at creating social capital, economic mobility, and systems that will help every child, family, and community thrive. Recognizing that family is a critical asset for child well-being, we must make a deliberate shift upstream and place an emphasis on prevention. Disrupting the cycle of poverty and trauma is not to interact with every day. There is no better individual to kick off this afternoon's conversation than Jamila Lemieux, a renowned cultural critic, award-winning writer, and millennial feminist. Jamila will both contribute her thoughts and moderate our panel discussion, asking the experts who do this work every day, what will it take to break barriers, center families, and transform systems? Jamila's written work has been featured in publications and digital platforms, including Essence, Mike, The Guardian, Color Lines, The Washington Post, The Columbia Journalism Review, The Nation, and The New York Times. Currently, she pens a weekly advice column for Slate's Care and Feeding Parenting, Parenting section and is a co-host for the Mom and Dad Are Fighting podcast. Jamila has appeared as a commentator on various news outlets, as well as Comedy Central's The Nightly Show with Larry Wilmore and The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. In 2018, she launched The Lemieux Group, a consulting firm that provides communications, public relations, and crisis management services. In this capacity, Jamila served as the communications and engagement strategist to Cynthia Nixon's campaign for governor, governor of New York and as a communication strategist for Girls for Gender Equity, a leading grassroots organizing, advocacy, policy, and service delivery organization centering youth of color within the racial and gender justice movement. As a public speaker, Jamila has addressed countless audiences at schools, conferences, and cultural events, including the official commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the death of Malcolm X. She has been featured on the Route 100 list of the nation's most influential African Americans and has been honored by Planned Parenthood, the New York City Council, the New York State Senate, Black Women's Blueprint, Walker's Legacy, and the Delta Rho Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Jamila will start off our afternoon discussion with her perspective on what it takes to center families. Jamila, welcome. Thank you so much for such a warm welcome. Uh, thank you everyone for participating this afternoon, for being here for what I think is gonna be a really powerful conversation, one that I am absolutely honored to host. Uh, thank you so much. Um, for having me, Children's Home and Aid. I, I'm really just um, touched to get to participate in a day like today. Uh, and so to kick things off, I wanna talk a little bit briefly about my um, some of my experiences with the concept of family. So I've been a mother for eight years, um, but it's only within the, the past six months that I've been able to recognize my daughter and I am a single mother and have been a single mother since my child was born. Um, it's only recently that I've come to understand the two of us as a family. I saw her as a member of the families that I belong to, my family that's my mother's side with her people and her siblings. And then there's the family I have with my father because my parents aren't together um, and my siblings, right? That I belong to these two families and my daughter thus also belongs to these families and she belongs to a family with her father, um, but that the two of us together are not a family. Uh, that we would not be a family until I repartnered uh, and got married. And though I've always been able to recognize other families that didn't fit the two parent model of uh, family as valid, I wasn't able to see that for myself. And I've had to spend a lot of time reckoning with what I've lost over the past eight years as a result. It's not that the world made it easy for me to see us and other families like us, perhaps, uh, as the idea of a sufficient family. The world meets single mothers, black single mothers in particular, with a lot of unkindness, 
which has significant ramifications considering that we make up 72% of black birthing people, or rather we are responsible for 72% of births in our community. Rather, we are responsible, we are halfway responsible, right? Because for those 72% of births that um, occurred to black single mothers, there was always a, another person who was involved in the birth. Yet, Black mothers, Black single mothers are spoken of as if there's no other group involved in the decision um, that led to our children being here. We are engaged by institutions, by pop culture, by uh, members of our own community in the same spirit of the Monaghan Report, the devastating attack on Black motherhood and Black women that was used to thwart civil rights legislation by posing Black mothers as the true enemies uh, of Black progress. So my co-parent and ex-boyfriend would be celebrated for his choice to be an active father, despite us not being together. And I would be looked down upon for parenting the exact same child. I'd be thought of as having less value as a woman than I did before. Nothing about that made me feel like I created a family. Rather, it made me feel that I could not give my daughter the one she deserved until I became someone's wife. Yet, were the memories that we made not as beautiful as the ones that were made in households where there were two parents? Was our home not filled with love? Do we not do all the same things that other families do just with a pair instead of a group? Would another child make this feel like a family or would I just feel more guilty for denying yet another young person the right way to grow up? This, thanks to my professional interest in the lives of women and a lot of self-work, I came to break those barriers and reset my understanding of family to be large enough to include the two of us as we are now, sufficient even if we never expand, and to include her father and his folk as part of my own tribe too. But even as I'm more kind to myself, this narrow vision of family and of good family in particular persists all around us. Single mothers rarely get to see ourselves reflected in popular culture in any positive way. We're typically cast as bitter, selfish, and irresponsible. When we're in need of help, those images don't make it easier for us to feel like we can call out and ask for it. What families of all size suffer from often is not a lack of members, but a lack of support, a lack of resources. Heads of household, who are often women, uh, being left to feel as though there's no one they can call on for support. There's no one they can call on when they need care, especially but not exclusively when they're single. And if society tells us that only one vision of family is valid, then how might one feel worthy of help maintaining something that isn't considered valuable enough to be protected in the first place? It is in those circumstances and so many others where the work of children's home and aid is so vital to prevent and address issues of maltreatment, families need tools, they need a lifeline. And at times that can be resources and guidance for managing parents' own behavior or helping them to seek counseling for a child that's showing signs of depression. It may come via services available for families that are looking to expand and foster or interventions to support a parent who has had to engage with the system. All of these families are valid all families are valid and all, all families are in need of some sort of support. We must come to expand both our collective understanding of family and our collective commitment to supporting families of all shapes and sizes. We must become family to one another as human beings sharing this planet and redouble our efforts to ensure that all children feel loved and cared for and that all caregivers feel that they have what they need in order to provide that. Today, I'm so excited to join Children's Home and Aid and these powerful stakeholders who are doing this work to discuss strategies to address the well being of our families, of all of our families who are in need of support. With that, I'm so excited to bring a very, very uh, illustrious panel to the stage. I want to welcome Jenna Gosti president and founder of JRA Consulting, which transforms the organizational cultures of child and family service organizations. Danielle Jeffrey, vice president of early childhood services at Children's Home and Aid. The honorable, excuse me, the honorable Zena Cruz, judge for the 20th Judicial Circuit in St. Clair County, Illinois. 
and Berto Aguayo, co-founder and executive director of Increase the Peace. Each of our panelists is gonna get the conversation started with some opening remarks, and then we are gonna open up and talk as a group. Uh, Jen, I am going to start with you. You have a long history of working to transform the culture of child welfare and child and family serving institutions. As the lead consultant for Breakthrough Series collaboratives across the country, Jen is focused specifically on how organizational changes are tested, implemented, and ultimately sustained in child welfare organizations. These organizational changes have included implementing specific practices, developing new policies, and implementing what ultimately becomes actual shifts in organizational culture. Since 2001, Jen has been involved in over 25 learning and breakthrough series collaboratives. She has adapted the model and worked with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. She continues to serve as a consultant and partner in, excuse me, in creating organizational change, building learning collaboratives and advancing racial justice in public and tribal child welfare agencies, healthcare organizations and nonprofit organizations. The constant in her work is the focus on racial equity and social justice. Jen, thank you for being here. Um, please take a few minutes to talk about why there needs to be a dramatic shift in our approach to child welfare, how what's going on now can devastate families and traumatize children, and how we can make child welfare uh, a system of last resort. Well, I had, first I should apologize. I think my technology is not the best today. Um, so hopefully that won't dampen the conversation. I had a whole bunch of prepared remarks and instead listening to you, Jamila, I feel like I'm gonna end up going off script for my, my short time. Um, but I wanna start just by reminding folks of the underpinnings, right, of child welfare. I don't think we can look at what we have now without recognizing that we have a system that's rooted in racism, judgment, and punishment. Um, that is the foundation. And that's where we have to start and own. When we think about when the federal government decided to become a player, right, decided to come engaged in child welfare, um, that was 1974. It was the heels of the civil rights movement. And what did the federal government decide to do? It focused on removing children, primarily children of color, from their families and communities. I don't believe things like that are accidental. I believe in system transformation work that every system is perfectly designed to achieve exactly the results that it gets, which means that our system is working perfectly as it was designed. It was designed to be a surveillance, coercive, punitive system that's doing exactly what we had planned. Um, but that being said, I always feel like I wanna point out when we think about the system, we have to own and acknowledge all of these incredible people who come and work in child welfare. So when I think of child welfare professionals listening to this, I actually don't think it should be about guilt because people come to this work with great intentions because they are passionate about helping children and families and communities. And then they come into a system that is designed to do exactly what it's doing, right? With its racist underpinnings, with the white supremacy culture that underlines and, and holds in place all of the systems that are that are doing this. So Jamila, when you ask sort of what the system does, what I think the system has done is it's systematically damaged families and children instead of helping them, right? It's systematically dismantled communities very, very purposefully. And the way it's done this, the, the punitive action that it's taken, I believe, is around trauma. We've, we've traumatized children by removing them. And we know there is unbelievable amounts of literature ranging from, um, you know, child development to child psychology to children's mental health. There are actually things written by by the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, what I would consider the the most you know sort of esteemed body in the country around child trauma, um, specifically around what it means to traumatic grief associated with removing children. Right, the American Bar Association has literature and how to respond to the trauma resulting from removal of children, separation. But we've also traumatized families and communities by continuing this legacy, right, of over-surveilling and then by punishing. We basically, we, we force people into our system and then we keep changing the rules of the game. We raise the bar so it becomes harder and harder and harder to get out. So what does all this mean, right? What does this mean? How do we undo it? Well, I believe um, the way we undo it is by naming it. 
right? We have to actually own the fact that we have these racist underpinnings. We have to own the fact that the roots of the racism are actually held in place by this, what I would consider white supremacy culture soil. So when Jill, Jamila talked about having a hard time seeing herself as a family with her daughter, it's because who gets to define what a family is, right? It's the white supremacy culture that has defined for us what families look like. It's that same culture that defines what safety looks like. And so until we can get families and communities to define what safety is, right? It's only then that we can start to undo, to redo, to think about, rethink about um, how we work with our children, families, and communities. When we think about, I wanna name this white supremacy culture that I keep talking about. I think a lot about the parable of the two fish swimming in the water and the one fish says to the other, what do you think about the water? And the fish responds, what's water, right? And white supremacy culture is that thing that we stop seeing, white people like me in particular, stop seeing it because we're so immersed in it all the time. We have to start seeing it and we have to start naming it and we have to start dismantling it because these are the foundations. So we have to get to a place where we trust families, where we respect families, where we honor that families and communities not only know what's best for their kids, but they actually want what's best for their kids. And right now our system doesn't honor that. Instead, we have people and practices and policies and laws that we undermine this notion that families think about and know what's best. The last thing I wanna say, because I, don't, I know we have so many great panels that I really wanna hear from as well, is I want us to, um, I wanna give a caution about looking for quick fixes. So it's easy for us to do implicit bias trainings, right? And think that once our staff think differently, the problem will be solved. It's easy to look for um, quick fixes like a blind removal practice, which I might suggest isn't very good practice, it's not very good casework to make removals without families in the room and present. But if we think that's a quick fix, that's a problem, right? Because when we look for quick fixes or uh, problematic or ineffective solutions to this bigger issue, we run the risk of not actually getting to the root. And that's what I actually think that we all should be collectively focused on. What we need is will and we need boldness and we need to focus, as Jamila said, on what happens upstream. What would happen if instead of saying, in order to care for your family the way you want to, right, by your relatives, by those people you consider family, in order to do that and get supported, you need to come into our system. You need to be watched by us. You need to play by our rules. And only then we'll give you support. But we're going to tell you it's going to be really, really hard for you to get out if you play that game. Why can't we just support families as they want to be supported? Wouldn't that make more sense? Instead, what we've done is we've created what I would call the foster care industrial complex, right? Where the only way agencies can actually get money is by putting kids, removing kids from their homes and putting them in placement, right? We need to shift that and we need to be bold and we need to challenge it. And we need to, to speak up when we see all of these instances, right? Of the institutional and structural racism that has taken hold. The one last thing I'll say, and then I swear I will stop for now, is in order to dismantle it, I believe that it takes all of us. So those of us who look like me, right, need to stop being allies and cheering the work on and step into the arena, be co-conspirators, act in solidarity, ask yourself not what you know, but what you have done to dismantle the system so that it can be transformed and so that it can actually not just stop doing the damage, but it, so that it can repair because I love the words reparation. It's about repairing and it's about healing. And how do we help these communities that we've systematically taken apart begin to heal so that they actually can provide the best support for their, for their children, for their families in the way that we know families do best, which is in strong families that live within strong communities. Sorry, the audio button is very sensitive. I keep thinking I'm unmuting and I'm not. Uh, thank you so much, Jen, for a really wonderful kickoff uh, to this conversation. Next, we're gonna hear from uh, Danielle Jeffrey. Danielle leads you're Children's mute, Home Jamila. and AIDS Earl. Am I? Uh-oh. Wait. Can you hear me now? 
Okay, good. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, it said I was unmuted. Okay, thank you so much for that, Jen. That was a really uh, powerful way to get us started. And now I want to introduce Danielle Jeffrey. Danielle leads Children's Home and AIDS early, excuse me, early care and education programs in the metropolitan Chicago region, which reach over 1,500 children and their families each year alone. When she joined Children's Home and Aid in 2013, she brought with her more than 11 years of leadership, research, and experience in early childhood development. Danielle's leadership is informed by her experiences as a teacher, a manager of social services, designer and implementer of curriculum, and director of programming. As the Vice President of Early Childhood Services, she inspires her team and advances best practices by integrating child development principles and education frameworks with the, with the agency's core beliefs and values. She completed the Head Start Management Fellows Program at UCLA Anderson School of Management. She has served on Accelerate Illinois, um, excuse me, the Accelerate Illinois Award of Excellence Advisory Panel. Danielle has also completed the Illinois Early Childhood Senior Leadership Cohort through the Erickson Institute and currently serves on its Early Childhood Leadership Academy Board. She is committed to guaranteeing that every child, every family is thriving and has the opportunity for educational success. Danielle, uh, thank you so much for being here and for your work. When we hear early, edu excuse me, when we hear the words early childhood education, we oftentimes think about both potential and limitless opportunities, right? This is the beginning of a child's life, the beginning of their education, the sky's the limit. Um, can you talk about how early childhood education can strengthen families, how it is the beginning, um, not just for a child, but it can be a beginning for a family um, and can increase social and economic mobility and be a true driver of equity? Thank you, Jamila, um, Jamila, uh, for, for that information and and, and introductory. Um, early childhood uh, plays a pivotal uh, role when we think about um, cradle to career, and we're trying to create this pathway to create generational wealth of our children and families that we are serving. And when we look at the bigger picture and understanding where we want to go um, as an organization, where we want our children to be and how we want them to be able to thrive and, and be engaged in, in civic duties um, when they get older, the, the first thing we have to really look at is equity. Um, and early childhood has definitely uh, been a tool to advance equity. Um, in our systems. And one of the things that we, you know, have to address is privilege and power. Uh, young children, um, you know, specifically preschool age children, internalizes his messages about privilege and power, uh, which they perpetuate through play and talk. And we have seen this and observed this over and over and over again to where they are creating this hierarchy of what is considered privilege and power based on what they're observing from the adults, from the community, what they see um, on TV. And as educators, we have to reinforce what is valued and what is not, and the importance of advancing social justice in our work. There's plenty of materials that we share with families and our children and books, social justice books that we read with our children to understand that everyone should be treated with equity and equality. And really understanding that self-identity is so important at a young age. And many folks think that, you know, you don't really learn about yourself or know who you are until you are, you know, until you're middle age, you know, middle school aged or high school age, uh, you know, adolescent. And that's simply not true. Um, and I think what we have to move away is color blindness. Um, color blindness, uh, blindness leads to color silence. We should be celebrating racial differences of everyone. And when we say we don't see color, we are really normalizing whiteness and convey the message that children of color uh, should be ashamed of their race or their race is not respected. And that is something that in early childhood, we want to have regard for everyone's race um, and, and to be able to provide that equitable opportunity. We cannot continue to disregard when questions come up about race. You know, children are very, very curious 
um, when it, it comes to race. And it's important to talk about race and not do the, the, the shh method. You know, anytime race comes up, oh, let's not talk about that. This is, this is not the platform. This is not the place um, to talk about race. And it should be the place to talk about race when children raise questions about race. Um, the concept, you know, of them not talking about race is because it makes them feel uncomfortable. It gets them into an uncomfortable space um, to where they feel like they do not want to be challenged. Um, and, and it's important for us to challenge these things that were these conversations that we're having. And if we're not having a conversation about race, race, we are perpetuating prejudice and racism um, within, within our work, um, within our organization, uh, within our community. And so having these conversations are, are, are very important and understanding that seeing color is not just about the color of people's skin. Seeing color means understanding that our lives are forged through racialized experience and histories and understanding who you are as a person. Um, it's very important to talk to children about where they are descended from, right? And, and oftentimes we don't have those conversations. Children need to understand their ancestry and bringing that culture into the, into the education and learning is so important. Um, when we see these behaviors are played out to why there seems to be a hierarchy uh, in the classroom structures and knowing that we are playing a part of that because we're not dismantling um, those behaviors. And some of the things that we, we see are children questioning why their skin are darker than another child's skin and being able to feel comfortable to talk about that. You know, the darker your skin, the more melanin you have. And there's nothing wrong with having more melanin than another person. It doesn't mean that you are uh, less equal to, to that particular child. But when we have classroom environments and the curriculum does not reflect the demographics and other race of the children that we are serving, it is perpetuating a racist environment. And when a, a child of color goes directly and picks up a white doll, and sees the doll as beautiful, white as beautiful and black and brown as not, then we have a serious problem that we have to address in our education system. And this really leads to the work um, that we are doing uh, with our uh, EDI and in, in, in advancing anti-racism anti in our in our in our work. And one of the things that we are focused on was African American boys. Um, getting to the root cause to why our African-American boys are not advancing at the same level of their white counterparts. Realizing that our staff did not understand black culture, but also did not understand the learning styles of black boys, and which is very, very important. And quickly, quickly learning through reflective conversation that black is seen as negative and white is seen as positive. And our society has painted that picture to where our own children, um, black and brown, white, sees white as the only positive image. And that is not something that we want our children to go into the next generation believing that white is, 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 is positive. Um, all colors. Uh, should be seen as as positive, and so we have to kind of recalibrate and ask our you know ask the question: Why is white seen as positive? And when we go into these spaces and we and we see people who do not look like them, no black men in the classroom. It's not reflective in the curriculum. It's not reflective in our hiring practices. That sends a very strong message. And and what we have to do is you know, really own that, why do we not have black men in education or people of color in education? Um, what can we be doing to be able to recruit and retain people of color to work with our, with our children? And, you know, really come into realization that we have to have some tough conversations that make people very, very uncomfortable to why we need to address structural and institutional racism. And not only calling 
out just racist behavior, but also calling out racial prejudice. And when we're working with African-American boys, there's a misconception of using uh, racial prejudice and, and being, using prejudice and racism interchangeably. And there are totally two different things. And getting down to the root of what makes a person prejudiced and what makes uh, uh, someone racist and understanding that and understanding that we have inflicted prejudice behaviors um, in our education system, we have to own that. Not liking a child because of stereotypical behavior, what they see or projected to see in social media or on TV and how that uh, is projected to the education of black boys uh, has a huge impact on outcomes and our children being ready for kindergarten. So first acknowledging that, and then two, acknowledging how do we become an anti-racist organization? How do we become anti-racist in the field of early childhood education and bringing our own awareness and understanding of our own culture and values and personal beliefs and biases and, and being able to be an ally to dismantle the inequities in our education system so our children can thrive and have the opportunities to create generational wealth. And we know from data and statistical data that black boys are suspended and expelled four times at a rate than their white counterparts. Um, and, and the same thing for Latinx uh, 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 children as well. And this is something that the system consistently blames people of color because they do not understand the culture of black and brown people. And in early, early, in, early, in early childhood education, we have to continue to focus around strengthening the entire family, providing opportunities for client voice in our program design to support children and families and address these barriers that are preventing them from social and economic mobility and being an active listener. And a lot of the times we are not actively listening, we're telling. And we have to take a step back and listen to what our clients, listen to what the community is saying and being an ally towards desire and needs to create generational wealth. And a lot of the times we're, we're in this mindset that we are inviting our clients to have a seat at the table to engage in a dialogue and not recognizing that they are the table and we are the ones who are taking a seat in their space and we need to listen to their barriers. They are the expertise of their family dynamics and they do not need people telling them what to do, how to do it and when to do it. And, and, and understanding that they should be the ones who are providing us with information and we are being the coaches and, and supporters, but we're not their savior. And we have this mentality of thinking we are saving someone and using our families as tokenism. And that should not be the case of where we are um, in this work. And early childhood has definitely set the precedence that we are moving in the right direction to dismantle the inequities that have been designed um, to have oppression over one group or another. And when we think about Brown versus Board of Education and how that law is meant to, you know, end segregations in our school systems. But now we're going back into resegregation because our children are separated by their socioeconomic status. They're separated by zip code. They're separated by the color of their skin, putting these barriers in place for them not to thrive. And that is a culture that we definitely have to change within our communities. So with that being said, uh, Jamila, I will turn it back over uh, to you. Thank you so much, Danielle. Uh, next, I want to introduce the Honorable Zena Cruz. Judge Cruz was appointed to the 20th Judicial Circuit in St. Clair County, Illinois in 2009 as an associate judge and was elected as a circuit judge in 2012. Judge Cruz is the first African-American woman elected to the circuit bench in, excuse me, in Southern Illinois. Prior to being a judge, to becoming a judge, she practiced law in Illinois and Missouri for approximately 15 years, owning a law firm and title insurance company. Her practice focused on areas of family and domestic law, criminal law, real estate law, non-for-profit organizations, and bankruptcy. 
Judge Cruz currently presides over a felony docket in two problem-solving courts, the St. Clair County Mental Health Court and Veteran Service Members Treatment uh, and Mental Health, excuse me, um, Treatment Court. Judge Cruz is the lead judge for the St. Clair County Annual Countywide Expungement and Sealing Summit and the Amnesty Slash Clean Slate Day. She was appointed by the Illinois Supreme Court and currently serves on the Special Advisory Committee on Justice and Mental Health Planning. She is a certified judicial mentor and judicial performance evaluator. And Judge Cruz is dedicated to community service and meets that commitment through membership and service organizations and her church. Judge Cruz. We move from an overview about early childhood education, which represents the idea of possibilities to a conversation about a system that oftentimes represents failure and the idea of um, dreams being derailed. Yet, I know that you are very passionate about the redemptive possibilities of justice. Uh, can you please talk to us a bit about your experiences on excuse me, rather, with about your experiences in the courtroom, what brings adults to you uh, and how can the justice system be a place where folks can access second chances and um, find their lives positively changed? Uh, thank you, uh, Jamila. That's a very good uh, narrative and discussion to have. I wanna first thank uh, Children's Home and Aid for inviting me to this table. Uh, I, this is a very timely and, and relevant discussion. And I, I'm really honored to be among such esteemed and uh, knowledgeable uh, panelists. Uh, so I wanna preface my uh, remarks with the understanding that there are different types of people and different ways that uh, adults end up in my courtroom. And I wanna be clear about the population uh, that I'm focusing my comments on. So we have those uh, who have no consideration for others and who act with malice or just utter disregard of the rule of law. And regardless of how they got to that point, uh, I'm not referring to these individuals uh, in this discussion. That, that's a whole other discussion. Uh, but then you have those who have a level of respect or basic regard for the law, but whose circumstances cause them to uh, feel hopeless or, or to give up or to give in to uh, breaking the law. And that, there's the subsection uh, that I wanna discuss. They find themselves criminally involved uh, out of what they see is uh, necessity or out of uh, the trying to get basic necessities or hopelessness. And although it is a difficult indictment, because I work so hard to uh, for it not to be true, I certainly appreciate the reality that the system of criminal justice does represent failure or potential derailed, uh, especially given the events that have plagued our national communities uh, and brought to light longstanding racial and cultural and ethnic inequities, neglect and malevolent treatment uh, by the non-marginalized. Uh, but with all that being said, I wanna focus on what we are doing, which supports breaking barriers, centering families and transforming systems. Understand that my uh, prime directive when I speak about justice is not just the punitive aspects of justice, but also the redemptive or rehabilitative aspects. It's in this way that, that we can be a tool for positive change in the criminal justice system. Uh, here in Illinois and specifically in, in my circuit, uh, we have pre disposition programs, we have post adjudication programs and post conviction programs in place. And when we talk about predisposition uh, situations, we're talking about uh, a person has been charged and there are diversion programs in place. Some of you uh, may be familiar with uh, offender accountability programs or uh, one of our retired judges, uh, Judge Annette Eckert started a, a teen court which is a diversion program for uh, young adults who find themselves criminally, uh, criminal justice involved. So uh, we also have our amnesty or clean slate day, people who have been charged and somehow gone awry, gotten out of place and haven't come to court and they have warrants for a uh, failures to appear or failures to do something or uh, uh, have not having done something. So, um, we have these in place uh, in a predisposition uh, 
aspect. And then we have what we call post adjudication. And the situations I am referring to are those where a person has entered a plea of guilty. However, any sentencing or other disposition is sort of put on hold or abated uh, pending uh, a qualified probation, such as first offender drug probation or second chance probation. Those are two where the individual doesn't receive a conviction so long as they follow the program or, or can they can walk down probation successfully, then the case will be dismissed. Then we have election of treatment, which is a qualified probation where conviction is entered, but it's just for the limited time of the probation. And at that point, if they walked it down successfully, then that case gets dismissed. And one that I'm really excited about because of its collaborative and therapeutic aspects is the first time weapons offender program, which of course, Children Home and Aid is an integral uh, part of. And similar to the a first two qualified probations that I spoke of, no conviction is entered, but the person goes through a, a program, not just probation, but they go through a program uh, designed to provide them with resources so that they won't fail and they can walk down the probation. And then that case is dismissed. Uh, other uh, post adjudication programs are our problem solving courts. Uh, Jamila, you mentioned that I preside over two of them. Uh, there are several, but in my circuit, we have drug court, mental health court, and veterans and service members court. Once again, they participate on a docket from anywhere from 12 to 24 months where they see me regularly and our team. We have a, a team of providers of uh, the VA, we have a probation officer who is the coordinator, other clinicians, the state's attorney, the public defender, all of these offices have come together to uh, make this a success and make it an option for people who qualify for those programs. So once again, at the end of a successful participation, those cases are dismissed. And then we deal with things that can be done after you actually have a conviction. And you uh, that brings up the ceiling and expungement summit. We have a countywide ceiling and expungement summit every year uh, because of course there are so many uh, negative effects of having those convictions. And sometimes it's simply arrests that are on record that uh, the summit is really helpful for helping folks so they can kind of have more control and be able to navigate their lives and 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 be able to be productive like they like they want to be. You know, I believe in the the village concept. Uh, it takes a village. And uh, when I think of the first time weapons offender program, I think that's a prime example because I think for the best results, especially in our society today, they occur when we have the collaborative and therapeutic combination of services and systems. Uh, that's the village, if you will. And uh, because often this is not just about lawlessness. This is about hopelessness. This is about the need for bare necessities. I had a young man tell me, your honor, I know you have to send me to the Department of Corrections because it's non-probationable. But I just want you to know when you gave me that, that qualified probation, that special probation so that I wouldn't get a felony, I had to go back into the same neighborhood. I had to go back into the same house, a house where since I was 13, my mother has not been in consistently for more than a week or so. And I had a nine year old brother that still needed to be taken care of. So it was left to me to feed him so that we can avoid going into uh, the system. So it's not just about, I just broke the law. It's about, he felt he had to. When I sent him, uh, gave him that probation and he went right back into the same neighborhood around the same people's people, he still had to protect himself. He still had to feed his then high school uh, little brother. And so you have all of these variables that get disregarded without collaborative and therapeutic efforts of more than one service agency and more than the criminal justice system. Understanding that this is not to get away from the punitive aspects, uh, punishment is a part of uh, committing a crime when you commit a crime, but also we cannot neglect the rehabilitative and the redemptive aspects of what justice is because that is what justice is. And I want to uh, finalize my remarks with the belief that we must keep in mind that systemic, 
systematic and the prevalent race, racism that we experience and have for hundreds of years are the bases for these barriers that many people face. Uh, for example, here locally, I'm in Southern Illinois and in East St. Louis over 100 years ago in 1917, there was the East St. Louis race riots. For a period of uh, over three months, black men, women, and children were murdered. They were sent into burning buildings to burn alive, uh, be, all because they were trying to come into a community where they found out that there was work and that they could make a living and that they could raise their families. And white Americans and citizens in East St. Louis were not going to have it. And so they took it out on these folks, burning them, murdering them, just making life a living hell. And they had to live through that. And events like this have led to the disenfranchisement and the disinvestment of whole communities and, and cultures. And I want to be clear, this is not pulling the race card, which, by the way, is often a deflection. Uh, used to avoid uh, real responsibility, but this is not what that is. It's not uh, pulling a race car so that we can play the blame game or justify some kind of lawlessness, but these are facts. Uh, these are types of, of events that are overarching bases for the macroaggressions and implicit biases that negatively and overwhelmingly affect those in marginalized communities. Thank you so much, uh, Judge Cruz. And last but certainly not least, uh, I want to welcome Berto Aguayo to the conversation. Uh, Berto develops young leaders and promotes peace through community organizing and policy advocacy through, in in through Increase the Peace, an organization that he co-founded in 2016 and currently leads as executive director. Increased the Peace reopened a community center, trained hundreds of residents in community organizing, organized dozens of actions to increase the peace, and has expanded its work to include violence prevention, youth development, food access, mutual aid, and multicultural unity initiatives. Berto holds two bachelor degrees, two bachelor's degrees in political science and economics. He's been a national leadership trainer with the Obama Foundation and was a 2019 Aspen Institute Ricardo Salinas Scholar. Berto's struggles and experiences as a former gang member led him on a personal, passionate journey towards social justice. He regularly comments on issues related to social justice and efforts to eradicate violence, and recently wrote about his life experiences and the police killing of Adam Toledo for Southside Weekly. Berto, we just heard Judge Cruz talk about the role of the criminal justice system in providing second chances and what her thoughts are um, on how we can prevent young people from coming in contact with the court system at all. You've lived uh, some of the experiences that we've spoken to this afternoon. You've walked in the shoes of some of the young people who've stood before her in court. Can you talk to us about some of the opportunities that made a difference in your life and how they can be expanded to other young adults and how the power of training young people to advocate and influence public policy can ultimately break the school to prison pipeline? Uh, most definitely. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you, everybody on here for dropping some gems. I, w I wish I could put the fire emoji on the chat, but I wasn't able to do that because I couldn't figure it out. Uh, but thank you all for that. Uh, and thank you, Children's Home and Aid, for hosting. Uh, so, yeah, although I think the opportunities that I received when I was younger, I think really center around this theme that in order to break barriers and in order to center families, we need to address the sim the systems that create violence and not just the symptoms, right, that are uh, created by violence or created by state uh, or racist structural systems. And so growing up, uh, you know, we, I lived, I live in back of the yards and I was born and raised by a single mother who emigrated here from Mexico. And I remember as a young kid, I loved playing soccer, you know, and my mom was working as a hairdresser every day to just try to put food on the table. And the older I got, the more expensive that hobby of playing soccer became, the more that I found myself, you know, home alone because my mom was working nonstop. And unfortunately, you know, I joined the gang when I was 13 years old because street gangs in our communities 
fill that void that I had as a young teen, right? They fill that void of a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose, a sense of opportunity, because a lot of our communities are deserts of opportunity. In communities like mine and back at the yards, 4,500 young people are out of school and out of work. In neighborhoods like Little Village, 71% of people, 71% of young people, 16 to 24, are, are unemployed. And so those are the systemic root causes that we're talking about. And for me, it was definitely true that when someone gave me that opportunity, I was able to go on a different path. Um, and talking to uh, Judge Cruz's, um, you know, it takes a village. For me, that was definitely true. It took a village. I remember that when I was around 14, 15 years old, my mom was so desperate to get me off the streets that she asked the local grocery store owner across the street from where she worked as a hairdresser if he could give me a job um, because she knew that a job would be the only thing that kept me from a casket or going to jail that that summer. And so when the st grocery store owner said, hey, look, I don't I don't got enough money to add somebody to the payroll. My mom said, I'll pay him his wage. Just get him off the street. And so for a while, when I was a teenager, that's where I learned, you know, the, the ethic of hard work, had a mentor in the grocery store owner, was mopping floors, washing dishes. And they didn't pay me a lot because my mom <laughs> didn't have that much money. Um, you know, it was a couple bucks at the end of the week. But it was that simple opportunity that kept me busy and I think was one of the reasons why I'm even here today. Um, secondly, there was another opportunity that I received when I was uh, older, about 16, 17 years old. I was sitting in the principal's office uh, for a gang fight and I remember that she comes into the office and she says, here's a job application. I don't want anything to happen to you this summer, so just apply. And if you need a recommendation letter, I'll write you one. So I ended up going into that interview my second it was like my first or second time being downtown i go into the interview and i thought i was going to be moving boxes or something like that but apparently this was an opportunity to intern with a city council member in the north side so here i am you know this gang affiliated teen in my community now getting accepted into this job where i'm traveling from back of the yards on 48th and halsted taking the bus to lincoln park on rightwood and halsted and that exposure just alone in the bus route, being able to see a bigger world than 47th Street and in the south than the south side, I think opened a lot of doors for me because I realized then I didn't have the language for it, but I saw the landscape of inequity. Going through the bus and seeing that when I was going into the bus on 48th and Halsted, I had to look over my shoulder. You know, there was, was cracked concrete. There was really no businesses. It was a lot of empty lots. But then as the more and more I got to the north side, and I got out of the bus, it was a thriving community with nice parks. I didn't have to look over my shoulder. And that filled me with a sense of anger. And at the same time, that opportunity while working there also filled me with the agency that I could change those conditions too. Because at that, um, at that alderman's office, I was working on getting people trash cans. I was working on connecting people to city resources. And it helped me find that sense of purpose and it helped me realize that I could be part of the change too, right? And so when I graduated college, I wanted to be able to recreate those very same experiences for other young people in my community. And so what we've done now and, and, and how I think that we can really um, solve the issue of violence is we can't solve it without youth voice because young people are the ones closest to the problem of violence. And so that's what we've done to increase the peace, engage young people, give them the tools to not only change themselves, but also to change their community and to really reframe the thought that, oh, in order for me to be successful, I need to make it out the hood and really start digging down and saying, in order to be successful, you can also make the hood a better place, right? And pass it forward and become a part of that village. And so a couple of the things that, that we've done in tackling the root causes is we recently uh, helped support a bill uh, on con in Congress called the Connecting Youth to Jobs Act that would give $40 billion um, set aside for uh, subsidizing youth jobs, $30 billion for subsidizing employment, but then also $10, $10 billion to be able to fund the wraparound services needed for a young person to be able to take advantage of that opportunity. Because we know we need to meet our community where it's at. And what does that mean? That means being able to provide young people with bus cards, Wi-Fi, right, being able, transportation expenses, 
all of those things that help provide the wraparound services that the system has failed to give to people in our communities. Um, and so all in all, when I think about what is it gonna take to be able to prevent more tragedies in our communities, but also to not have young people interact with the criminal justice system at all, it's really attacking the root causes of the issue. And what I've seen when it comes to police or street violence is that they have a common denominator. It's disinvestment, right? It's disinvestment that comes in the form of funding 40% of our city budget into the police department and only 1% on violence prevention services, right? And let a fraction of that on all the other wraparound services that are needed to create healthy communities. And it, this is not a radical belief. A lot of times communities like ours just want what young people in the suburbs and Lakeview and Lincoln Park have, right? That shouldn't be um, an altruistic demand, that's, that should, that's justice. And so I also think that in order for us to rethink what safety looks like, we need to be restorative instead of punitive, right? And we need to be uh, preventative and proactive instead of reactive to the issues that we face. And in order to do that, we need to give young people the tools. We need to elevate their voices and listen to them about what they need. Thank you so much, Berto. Okay, um, Jen, I'm gonna move a little quickly just cause I know we're a little uh, behind. Jen, I wanna start with you. Um, I have a quote and two facts that really highlight how high the stakes are with this work. Uh, the fact of being in foster care is a trauma experience every day. It lives in our bodies. That's a quote from a children's home and aid staff person who entered foster care as a teenager. So in Illinois, 84% of the children removed from their homes were removed for neglect, not abuse. A majority of the children in foster care in Illinois, 58% are children of color. Jen, there's a lot of debate about the child welfare system and whether it should be abolished or reformed. What does abolishment look like for child welfare and is reform even possible to begin with? What do you think is best for our children, youth and families in terms of the system as we know it? Yeah, well, I, I think that what's best for our children and families is what they tell us. I think that you know, sitting in an ivory tower and trying to make these determinations is part of the problem. Um, but I also think that the word abolish scares people for some reason. And when I think about the abolition movement, right, and I think the idea of abolishing a system that is rooted in racism, built upon the foundations of white supremacy culture, right, that is about coercive, punitive um, action, to me, it's a no-brainer, right? Is that a system we really want? And I personally, again, um, reform doesn't do it for me because reform means we're reforming something using the same pieces and the pieces are the wrong pieces. So I don't think if we move the pieces around, it suddenly makes our system better and it suddenly makes our outcomes better. I think um, we really do need to abolish what we have. And, and the folks at the up end movement, which is sort of the big players in the, in the world of child welfare abolition, I think they would agree in saying that Abolition doesn't mean that we don't care about protecting children or children being safe. It just means that there are better ways to do it than what we're doing today. And what they involve is strengthening communities, strengthening families so that they can actually raise safe and protected um, and well children. Um, that our child welfare system has never done a good job at that. And why we think that somehow moving the pieces around will um, doesn't really make sense. Thank you. Danielle, uh, there's been talk about the idea that, or rather in this conversation, we've discussed the fact that uh, the support that families need to nurture their children exists outside of the child welfare system, right? Uh, when you have programs like Early Head Start and Head Start that are specifically designed to help parents meet those goals, um, Sometimes there's a conflict when those systems or those programs come into contact with the child welfare system. How is the early education community doing in terms of working with families that have been uh, involved in the child welfare system? You know, I can say what I can say is um, 
Head Start, um, the Head Start community recognizes uh, the importance of working um, with uh, child welfare uh, clients. And, you know, five years ago, we, you know, we couldn't say that. Um, the, you know, in really looking at how we um, work with our clients um, that are in intact, um, in kinship care, uh, which is which is in, in, in important. Um, you know, we do not want children to wound up in the foster care system. Um, you know, we don't want children to wind up in kinship care or intact, um, but at least it's with the family member with the intent to have that child uh, be uh, with their custodial uh, guardian. And that's the, the you know, that's the, the goal at the end of the day. And the Head Start community is taking a more proactive approach to engaging families when there's child welfare involvement um, using this from a strength-based and trauma-informed approach and building trusting relationships with families. And I, I, I've heard trust, building trust and relationships um, in pretty much in everyone's comments. And, and that is where we need to begin. We have to begin with building those relationships with the families and having and, and embracing that the families are the experts, right? In overcoming their challenges and achieving their goals, we have to be able to build relationships to set goal-oriented goals, right? Um, and, and using intact and, 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 and kinship care families as part of our weighted selection criteria process and, and making sure that we increase the number of points um, so we can serve these families in our early childhood program. Um, this is something that we're doing um, at Children's Home and Aid because we recognize that we're seeing uh, an increased population of intact and kinship care families. And from a policy standpoint, and when we think about what systems can we change, um, you know, foster care children are automatically eligible for our, for our program, but intact in kinship care are not, especially when it's tied to abuse and neglect. And so what I would really, you know, advocate for um, and the community to advocate for and the Head Start community to advocate for is making um, our, our families that are part of child welfare with intact and kinship care automatically eligible um, for, our, for our services. Um, they're just in need of the services or, uh, you know, than any other uh, population that we are serving in our program. And we do need to take a stance um, in engaging in having a policy uh, reform around intact and kinship care. Thank you. Judge Cruz, um, in the past year and a half, the coronavirus pandemic has completely turned our lives upside down in so many ways. It's the reason that we're looking at each other um, from our respective computers instead of being perhaps in the same space. Uh, I'd like to hear what the pandemic's impact has been on some of the people that are coming before you in your courtroom um, and what sort of interventions on the policy side would help uh, both before and in the wake of this um, pandemic, which has made the lives of those that are struggling even more challenging. You know, that's a really good question. And it is one that is fluid and it is uh, evolving. Certainly at the onset, I guess a year and a few months ago, uh, we had to look to our Supreme Court to find out how we were to proceed. There are uh, constitutional rights that uh, defendants have that uh, we had to figure out how we can uh, still meet those without putting them or uh, everyone else at risk. And so justice sort of went uh, really slow. It's slowed down and, and in some cases, uh, some may feel it just sort of stopped. Uh, we did the best that we could to come up with ways uh, of meeting the needs. We, as you indicated, went virtual with a lot of settings. The Supreme Court weekly, sometimes more than weekly, came out with initiatives uh, to come up with ways that we could uh, sort of use diverse uh, means for meeting the needs, making sure that we weren't stepping on constitutional rights and that we could move at a, an acceptable pace that wasn't putting a whole community uh, at risk of contracting COVID. And so we, uh, 
different circuits have been able to put different programs in place. We uh, took advantage of the directive of being able to use Zoom in settings and for dockets that before had to be in person. And so we made our best efforts to have the communications back and forth between particularly those who are being held in the county jail. Uh, for those who are out of custody pre-trial, there wasn't as much of, of an urgency as it was for those who were sitting in jail. So we just tried to do whatever we could virtually. We slowly brought people over with safeguards in place. Uh, logistically, we made sure that the building uh, could be entered and could be used uh, for those purposes. Our county uh, made it a priority that our criminal justice system could still uh, function at its best pace uh, in light of the pandemic. Thank you. Uh, Berto, what is it that you wish that the public and, excuse me, that you wish that policymakers understood about uh, the young people that find themselves in Judge Cruz's courtroom or in some of the situations that you found yourself in in the past? What is it that people just don't get about them? Yeah, I think one of the things and messages that I've been, um, sound like a broken record because I've said it a lot of times in different occasions, but I think one of the things is that you can't use the same tactics to solve the problem that you failed to solve to begin with. Um, and that you need to listen to people in communities that are the, the most proximate to the problem themselves and the ones that are most affected. Um, I think another thing that I would tell elected officials is to stop trying to manage the problem and solve it. <laughs> Because I think there's a lot of times when elected officials get together and they pat themselves on the back for doing the bare minimum. And I think it's time for us to start demanding a lot more than that. Um, additionally, I think that one of the things that we've been able to do with, with, with Increase of Peace and with the work that we do is really exemplify that once you give a young person an opportunity and that invitation to get involved, more often than not, they will excel at it because a lot of our young people already have skills that they have, that they just need someone to give them a hand. I'll give you one example of something that we did during the COVID-19 pandemic. We literally hired young people to help residents in the community get the COVID-19 vaccine because we knew, number one, they have the relationships in the community, they are trusted messengers, and they are tech savvy and social media savvy, so they know how to work a phone and get people registered. The first day, that the, the vaccines were available in our community, all those slots to, for appointments were reserved. They were gone within less than 24 hours, right? And that just speaks to when we give young people an opportunity, they will excel and exceed your expectations. Um, and another thing that I would also add on to that is that over the COVID-19 pandemic, our young people have been not only registering all the residents for the COVID-19 vaccine, They've also been out organizing food pantries. Uh, they've also been organizing basketball games. Just this past Friday, um, we organized a Black and Brown Unity Car Parade, our second annual Black and Brown Unity Car Parade in which we brought together Black and Brown communities because we know that we face the same issues and we can only solve them together. Um, and so those are all young people that at one point were being discarded by the system, that were being told that, oh, you know, your, your, your quote unquote damaged goods. And we have shown that like when we give young people an opportunity, all young people can succeed if we give them the right opportunity, the right support system and the right mentorship and the right guidance. And so that's what I would tell elected officials and, and, and policymakers to trust that our communities know what they need and to listen to our young people when they ask for what they need. Jen, one of the worst things that can happen to a family is the removal of a child, right? It, it's traumatic for, uh, it can be traumatic for all parties involved. It, it's not ideal circumstances uh, to say the absolute least. There of course have been many instances in which children have been removed from households where one might argue that other things could have been done to make the household uh, happy and healthy and safe for these entire families. Uh, 
And there have been people who've been on the other side of that, who've had their children removed, that have done advocacy work, that have engaged with the system and have said, here's how I could have been helped differently. Here's what we needed. Um, here's what you know happened to us as a result of this removal. Uh, and there have been reforms put into place as a result of that advocacy and hearing that perspective. Can you talk a bit about how families that have been involved with the child welfare system have been able to positively influence changes by sharing their experiences and fighting for others to have uh, perhaps better outcomes uh, than they did? Yeah, I actually want to talk about a particular example, which isn't actually parents, but it's young people. And um, I live in, in New England. And so the six New England states, probably back in about uh, the early 2010s, um, there were young people who had aged out of foster care who actually came together in this coalition. And what they started to do was um, advocate very strongly for what it looked like for them from their experience of what was what was normal, what was not normal. And through that advocacy, they ended up drafting and, and actually passing um, what they called a sibling bill of rights. So when a young person gets placed into foster care, what rights do they have around being able to see their siblings um, and have communication, right? Because we know that not only is the trauma of removal significant from parents, but when we break up family units, because we don't have enough space in bed and houses or you know the right placement, um, what does that mean for young people? So they did that. They did what what they really taught us so much about what it is to live in foster care as a young person and not be able to go to sleepover parties unless people get background record checks, to not be able to go to prom, right? To not get a driver's license or be able to drive a car, or take driver's ed, right? All of these things. To, to Berto's point, right? They can't get jobs because they need to get background record checks so that people that they're going to work for and then they have to get permission to be out of the home and and so. What are we doing to young people when we remove them? And there's again, the trauma of separation and then the trauma of experience that we don't let them live normal lives as young people. And so again, it was the young people themselves who came together through a lot of support from different adults in different situations, but um, that group still exists. It's 2021. There is still a thriving New England Youth Coalition that has succession planning and has a structure and young people in New England when they're in care and when they age out of care can join this not just for peer mentorship and the peer mentorship as someone wrote in the chat is phenomenal but they can actually use it to do what Dr. Wisdom Powell refers to as radical healing which is to become an advocate in their life as a part of their healing from their own trauma um, in ways that are meaningful and lasting and significant. Uh, Danielle uh, I'm going to try to get everyone one more individual question before we get out of here. When it comes time to enroll a child who has been exposed to um, abuse or neglect at home in an early child care or education program, what sort of practices and policies are necessary to help this child uh, thrive in school? Well, I think, you know, making sure that we have systems um, in place uh, to not only ensure that the child is thriving, but the family, the entire family. And oftentimes um, the system is set up to support it, either one or the other. Um, and, and it doesn't look at the work through a two generational um, approach. And when our children um, enroll in our program, we're providing opportunities not only to work with only just a child, but also with the family and in working with them through their traumas. And we oftentimes when the children enter our program, that trauma has been cascaded down um, already to that child. Um, and being, you know, having the opportunity to provide health and wellness uh, with our families and especially in black and brown communities where it's a stigma uh, not to get mental health uh, support. And one of the things that we looked at is making sure that we have mental health therapists 
um, and personnel that reflect the color of the resurgent. And right now we have an Afro Latina um, mental health therapist, very good with the with the with the families and ensuring um, that we are providing the proper uh, resources and helping them through the healing uh, process to be able to move forward. And one of the things that we are focused on as part of that healing, um, we hire in early childhood. We have hired 17 percent of the clients that we serve. And I think that that is making an investment. That's a true investment of the work that we're doing. We are supporting families, not providing them, supporting them with the tools and resources that they need to be able to provide for their family, to be able to be successful and to thrive and be able to cascade that positivity down to their child and let them see them doing those things in action. Um, I think, you know, we need to provide more opportunities for that, for the community uh, to be able to be engaged in these conversations and in, in young folks um, as well. And so I, I just, Thank goodness for the organization, the platform that Children's Home and Aid has provided for us to be able uh, to do that. Many organizations do not uh, do that. And that's a living testimony to, to our work. That when you work with the whole family and strengthen the whole family, then everyone thrives at the end of the day. So um, I think it's very important that, that we um, um, uh, preface that. Berto, um, uh oh. Am I getting the wrap it up? <laughs> <laughs> I know I hate to come on this amazing conversation. We are so grateful. That was such a powerful um, panel conversation. And Jamila, we are so beyond grateful for, for your being here and moderating and helping to have this conversation. Um, and we definitely want to continue the, the, the conversation for, for all of us knowing that the work doesn't begin or end here. It's just a continuation of, of our attempt to break barriers, center families, and transform systems. So Jamila, Danielle, Judge Cruz, and Berto, and Jen Agosti, thank you so much for being here with us today. We are so incredibly grateful. And I know that we want to be thoughtful of uh, ending on time, but we do have one final speaker with us. And I have the great privilege of introducing um, our board of chair for our Children's Home and Aid, Charlie Goffin, who is going to close us out for the day. Thanks, Tara. Can you hear me? We can. Yay. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, and Jamila, thanks for guiding us through such a dynamic conversation this afternoon. It's terrific. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers today, and I also want to thank everyone for joining us and participating in this moving day of collective learning. This afternoon, we have the chance to engage with a wide range of voices and perspectives on the actions that we can take collectively to advance anti-racist, equitable policies that promote child, family, and community well-being. Our vision is all children and families thriving in strong communities. Uh, Jamila's uh, personal and heartfelt remarks remind us of the importance of viewing the children we work with in the context of their broader families and providing support to those families. Jen noted that the system is to a large extent rooted in racism, judgment, and punishment, and that we're going to have to be bold and drive significant systemic change if we truly want to support families and communities. Danielle made the case so well that early childhood services are essential to promote equity and that we need an racist approach, um, starting with kids at the youngest age, encouraging, encouraging them to understand, appreciate, and celebrate their own identity, including their race. Um, Judge Cruz um, offered uplifting remarks about how justice is much bigger and broader of a concept than punishment. Uh, the, ju the judicial system, she told us, has the potential to use a range of creative programs and approaches to counter systemic racism, to promote rehabilitation, and to advance healing. Um, how I wish every jurist shared her wisdom, compassion, and appreciation for thoughtful policies and solutions. And finally, Berto offered a very personal story of his early awakening to the landscape of inequity in our society. His realization that he could actually help make the world a better place through his own actions and his proceeding to do exactly that. Go Birdo. If you represent the next generation and thus the future of this country, we're gonna be just fine. We're gonna be great. At Children's Home and Aid, we've always asked ourselves, what can we do better? That developmental mindset has shaped the evolution of our mission and vision through the decades and now drives our commitment to meet the moment 
by surfacing new and more effective ways to solve complex and intractable social problems. To that end, this morning, our board of trustees approved a new strategic plan that will guide us in our pursuit of transformational change and help bridge a path to a future where social capital, economic mobility, and outcomes vital for children and youth to thrive are not predicted by race or by zip code. We'll do this by pushing ourselves to enable more children and families to thrive, where families receive the services they feel they need, and fewer children are adversely affected by the child welfare system. Children's Home and Aid is uniquely poised to do this work. We have a history of pushing boundaries, transforming systems, and improving practice. This is a part of our organizational DNA. We know that all families have strengths and that they know what they need most, and we're listening. Just as a final thought, this morning, Baratunde told us that we don't have to go it alone as we take on the biggest challenges. We inherit this tale that we're in this ourselves, he said. It's a dangerous mythology. We need to work together because we can't do most big things ourselves. So let's all join hands and commit ourselves to making the necessary changes that our speakers today have addressed so powerfully. Are you in? Please join us. Thank you.